Years before North Park Cineplex turned movie-going into a tidy antiseptic experience, rather like visiting a state-of-the-art light recycling center, our family piled into the blue pillow-packed LTD and journeyed to the Bel Air Drive-In on Locust Street, past the rotating Hinny Pinny chicken bucket and gas Green Station dinosaur. It took father two cigarette cigarettes to get there and mother twice as many pages of in cold blood. She pressed the paperback to her face like a beauty treatment. Writhing between them on a newspaper was diapered Mitzi. Snacks everywhere, bags and cans and leakage, stuffed animals, napkins, fly swatters. I elbowed Howard and Elizabeth in the pungent back seat. They never moved over enough. Forgot they were younger, though I wore the best reminder, black plastic senatorial glasses. They battled me for position in pretzel logs and blankets as the car turtled toward our first triple feature. Christopher Lee as Dracula, sixth generation Wolfman, Night of the Living Dead. The Bel Air Marquis blinked pink, a neon palm tree swaying and renouncing dusk. Told I owned a soul, I never argued, but would have preferred part of me were neon a gnarly glow attracting a firefly's haze of blinking taillights. Rear of the screen towered over the palm tree like a second sky. Around the complex stretched the whitewashed wall. It was a cinematic pin beckoning to herds of eyes, a mean cold barrier, wall child of the wall cutting Berlin in half. You had to go around on a gravel road between cinder blocks and a tall chain link fairgrounds fence. Hot rods ahead, behind. The wait to buy tickets, the crawl, the time to speculate about a giveaway, a premium. Test tube of slime, plastic fangs, pencil, pencil eraser, tombstone stamped RIP. Tires grinding gravel, exhaust yeastily mixing with dust, mixing with cigarette smoke, more and more screams. Immaturity, certainly we were immature, but it was more than that and we knew it without being able to say it. We were, unlike old fogies, sensitive to the changing light. Dusk a hood being slipped over Iowa. Late light, most holy and most unholy. Gray, hounding light. Sun, sun's dregs, stark, unabashed fading of every single reliable thing. Each fence link and shirt button and vehicular Detroit minted molecule. A surreal feeling of simultaneously losing and attaining experience. Of losing it because you were attaining it. You, a being of flawed receptive abilities. Fair grandstand loomed beyond the fence like remains of a bigger burned out building. At chute's end stood the concrete booth containing the man clad in custodial green. He was not the one to ask about giveaways. He was rough as bark. Anyway, any voice through the speaker was an indecipherable howl. Father cupped an ear. Booth finger pointed at posted prices. Adults $2, children $1, babies free. Kicking Mitzi held aloft for the man to question silently, to judge. Father stuffed bucks through the half moon hole, got back tickies and a card stating there was a stock car race tonight at the Mississippi Valley Fairground, so prepare to be deafened. No refunds, no exceptions. No kidding. Hot rod honked. Our dust unfurled again. We exited chute. Gravel swells, speaker poles, ocean waves of desert, desert substance, dry and skeletal and always summer. There could be no winter at the Bel Air drive-in, I was convinced. Impossible. When the rest of Davenport was hubcap deep in snow, behind the Bel Air wall, it would be August, 86, humid yellow. The air full of monarchs, geese, and other birds too lazy or sick to migrate to Mexico. The car floated slowly toward the screen, a blank picture frame tacked to horizon ashes. Under it lurked a sad playground, rusty equipment stuck like splinters in the weeds, fuddy-duddy lawn chairs, lawn chair picnics were taking place around parked cars up front. Vans and VW bugs and station wagons and convertibles Bare legs swinging off the back of a truck gate. Teenagers who necked? Elizabeth and I would keep close track of them as the night wore on. 
Six packs, calico ponchos, pirate shirts, overalls, no shirt under, muscle shirts. America excluding its authority figures. No teachers, badges, or ties. Schlitz cans were hoisted in acknowledgement of our passing clamor, and Father commanded, don't respond. He lived in fear of belonging, and his wish came true again. Mr. Sideburns displayed a middle finger, nail cracked and black. Here we made enemies instantly, just as we had when moving to the old east side a month before. Only shut-ins could tolerate us, and the other family that did not mow. Stop here, Dave. He did not obey his co-pilot. He was, she wanted to be near the restrooms, he the screen. A fight about their future that both lost when one won. They shouted out windows. It wouldn't have helped if they had looked at each other. Stuff between them was too thick to see through. Diapers to change, come off it, you come off it. I wanna see, the diaper bag, listen, go lay an egg, slow down. He speeded up to three miles per hour. Dented bumper pitched on the sea turned to rocks. By what? What else? A magic spell of spills and Hollywood star power. Mitzi wailed. Elizabeth, hugging doll honey bunch, asked to shake the chewed nipple bottle and loosen up vitamins in, in the formula. It wasn't milk. It was formula. She could. Howard poked me. He was sharp like a stick, whittled everywhere I was soft and soon to be more than soft, obese. At last, our slow boat docked at a pole in the fourth row, and Father went about the tough task of clamping the heavy speaker to window glass. Nuts, he yelped when, when challenged. Things kept going wrong. His awkwardness was not at fault, though, this time. Nothing in life prepared a person for the drive-in speaker ordeal. Either the car was too close to the pole, and high-voltage power cords crept like spider legs into the driver's seat, or the car was too far away from the pole, the speaker barely reaching. Reparked six times and those errors were multiplied by inches, this way or that. Impossible situation. Barely any light to work in. And the work of clamping, reparking, clamping, reparking must also be done under the duress of a pole sign declaring that a fine and possibly jail time would be the fate of any customer who yanked a speaker off its pathetic mooring. The speaker, a Martian head, knob eyes, triangular mouth mesh buzzing, announcing the snack bar was open. Hurry in to sample our favorite soft drinks and piping hot. We've got food, insisted mother. Who wants to go to the snack bar, asked her rival, our ladder to heaven. We had nothing hot. We had no cold cans. Back seat emptied. Ladder eased his aching runs, rungs out of the car. He held a spray can, line up. Bending, he encyclopedia mis encyclopedically misted us with insect repellent. No millimeter of exposed skin missed. Ankles, wrists, forearms, neck, front and back. In another life, had he been an exterminator? The spray stung like lemons, tasted like poison, the first course of our feast. Dave, don't go, she cried, he did. She began to plot her revenge, the usual one changing Mitzi's diaper on the car hood during the best parts of the movie. <laughs> Going was slow due to father's rotten leg and hip. Howard and Elizabeth and I ran ahead and circled back to the limping, fuming figure in the short-sleeved shirt. The cinder block snack bar had no windows, only the vents. Out the screen door poured people clutching trays of hot food filed in silver sleeves. They passed us and we caught sweet whiffs of Greece. Last light was falling out of the sky, the white grain rain. The drive-in appeared to hover in a translucent sandstorm terminating at the projectionist's hut, exact size and shape of a World War II pillbox. Back at the car, mother waved a diaper out the open window. Still not surrendering, it was not a white diaper. I watched her carefully, too carefully, but she called for that. She never surrendered. Strong constitution. Did not waddle hand on back when pregnant. Tilted her weight forward and gained momentum and ran over father. She left him in the dust every day of the week, save on Sunday afternoon when they took a noisy nap and panted in the dog language. Her weak spot? Her gums. She gargled and she spit red. The gums stayed sick and made her talk sick too, 
Cold words came out giggly warm, and warm words emerged sounding like love in cold blood. Her stories of her life before us turned to a hurricane of sighs after 15 seconds. Sighs about tire swings and outhouses and law school, of all things, law school. But it didn't work out. Nothing had. We reached the snack bar. How could a movie be scarier than it? In the lost and found box resided the heartbreaking rain bonnet and one tiny green boot. Overbites, underbites, chins training to be chins. One forlorn server wore the horrific nameplate that results when well-meaning parents look too hard at a baby name book. Aloysius. Ice cream cups removed from the steel quilted freezer instantly melted and left the buyer holding a silly two-inch wooden oar. Hydrogenated coconut oil popcorn machine fragrance and chemical restroom reek. reek. The floor in there, clammy, no paper towels, no toilet paper, lidless holes, and the metal trough. Howard missed, too. Spiders, the puddles, father yelling, get trays. Where? Nothing held together worse than a life. It fell apart in a seamless, ceaseless flow. But that was all right. We were used to it, right? Given trays, we slid them, enjoying each line inch to the disdain of those behind. Coffee service coffee self-service machine with a photo of a self-service coffee machine on it. Orangeade bubbling in the day glow tank I could have watched for hours. Soda dispenser hissed. Popcorn spilled from a silver hat in the greasy case. Foot-long hot dogs and buns, chili-smeared coney dogs, stick-impaled corn dogs, cups of onion rings and french fries, a fire with light bulb light, if cold looking. Father's eyelids fluttered like glow-frenzied insects. Two footlongs, a corn dog. Mother could live on sorrow alone, but not him, not us. Cotton candy, the blue, the pink too. Popcorn, two striped buckets. Headband man lost it behind us and said dirty words to Eloisius, who said better dirty words back. Father paid with a green crumple. We left. Howard repeated words he had just learned then spit popcorn. Stop it. Maroon clouds etched the sky like dyed radio waves. Important not to drop cola cup, clogged with ice diamonds. Important not to drop cola, popcorn. Many reasons to drop cola, popcorn. Gravel sliding underfoot and shifting litter not easy to see, soaked in gray-blue Civil War dust hues. Howard dropped the bucket and laughed. Father yelled, lighters flashed, interior car lights glimpse of the pink-haired dashboard gnome. Watch out for glass, whispered Elizabeth to Honeybunch and me, her other charity case. Beer drinker chant, get it on, get it on. If mosquitoes bit the screen, would Dracula get a taste of his own blood-sucking medicine, itch and repent? Where was the car? Finally, we heard it moaning at the thought of how much money had been spent. Fighting over blankets and pillows equaled the premier sport during empty drive-in movie interludes, pulling, tugging, twisting cotton as if it were the dirty fabric of time between us and showtime. When? When? Then organ music crackled over the speaker, and gothic turrets of the Count's mountain castle sprouted on the screen. Hell hung on the heavens. Elizabeth grabbed me, Howard smacked me, the velvet-lined casket cracked like an egg, and out came Dracula in cape, cuffs, cravat, white skin, thirsty eyes. Christopher Lee did not lurch like Lon Chaney, or prance like Bella Lugosi, or always appear on the verge of telling a corny joke like Vincent Price. Christopher Lee was quiet, collected, cordial, skeletal, clerkish. He acted as if he had a fine suit to sell you, then bit your neck in an alley and you were damned to walk the earth forever, draining the life out of neighbors, friends. The classic story would have been absolutely terrifying if mother had not comically changed Mitzi's diaper on the hood three times, on-screen victims upstaged by sisters' yippee yay yelps when pricked by duck safety pins. I was almost th thankful when the car races began. Zoom! Zoom! Drowning out diaper racket and making it sound as if 
the Transylvanian village were located off a major American highway serviced by Stuckey's. The thunder of the souped up Chevy spoiled the debut of sixth generation Wolfman too. You could not even hear him growl. You heard number 51, our neighbor, mechanic Wayne, pass number 34. And number 24 passed number 51. And number 18 passed number 24. And number three passed 18. And number 62 passed three and slammed into many hay bales as the grandstand crowd approved and Bel Air customers cussed, tossed bottles, and ripped speakers off poles in their haste to exit. What could the Bel Air owner do? Only one thing, insert an extra long intermission after the second movie. That way, the third flick started after the races concluded around midnight. After four straight hours in the car, we were syrup-skinned and bent into improbable shapes that could kick and punch no more. Done fighting. The silence following the last race was barely noticed. We were insensate, heat drunk, tongue swollen, father out of cigarettes, chewing nails, mother, a baby, crying softly. Howard snoozing like a bee, Elizabeth and Honeybunch and I kept awake by the scintillating sight of the playground teeter-totter going up and down like a coffin lid opening. Who played there? Swings creaked and shadows leapt like sheep over fence railings. The air redolent of damp coffee grounds and worms. The shut snack bar cut the profile of a mausoleum in a cemetery in a little town with only one rich family. Other citizens interred in the rusty vehicles they had lived out of. The pillbox, where was it? The moon, the ripe, ochre cratered moon seemed to be the lens projecting opening credits onto the picture frame. Night of the Living Dead, directed by George Romero. Elizabeth hugged me. Father leaned forward, elbow rung, shoulder rung, chin rung. Be quiet he said to the quiet. A car was on a winding cemetery road. Inside, the squabbling brother and sister, twilight, going to visit their father's grave, unless I was confused already and plots often lost me quick. They found the grave, laid flowers on grass. They went back to the car. It did not start. Brother went for help and was killed by an oddly walking man. Sister got worried, left the car, banged on a caretaker's door. Odd man answered. Then the house phone did not work. She got nervous, went over to the window. Cemetery ground moved, soil stirred, a knuckle burst through. The ground was breaking open. That is, the ground was breaking open. That in it coming out, out. Open graves on the screen and the loose gravel under the car, the mounds of gravel around the car, ankles tingling in my socks, needle feet. Nightmares entered the veins through the eyes and ears and then flowed through the body. My nose tingling, my elbows tingling, my knees clamped together. We were at that cemetery. We were there. The film showed things, projected pictures in your mind like only a parent could. Collarbones, knee bones, wrist bones, skulls pushing through damp dirt and into the night. Bones in old skirts, tuxedo tatters, baseball uniforms. A stumbling skeleton wearing a World War I helmet. The was is. Ancestors returned to tell us something we would not ever want to know. And that piece continues on to explore the phenomenon of the neighborhood theater, a small theater sort of hidden in a residential area, and also the phenomenon of the movie palace, which was very much fading in the 70s, but there was still one in downtown Davenport called the Capitol Theater. Thank you.